You know, it's a weird question, but I thought I'd ask it bluntly to Fee Waybill of the Tubes. Why are you still alive? Rock and roll excess, as you all know, has taken away so many people that we love. There are people sometimes who die of cancer or in rock and roll, and the doctors will say, oh, you died of lifestyle cancer. But one way or the other, the when in Rome lifestyle of rock and roll can really hurt a lot of performers and end their life very early. That's something we talked about with Fee Way Bill of the Tubes. Remember, the entire interview is also on our sister channel, Rock History Book. Click in the description and you'll see it all. Here's Fee Way Bill. Well, I'm going to ask you the why aren't you dead question. Artists really love that one a lot. No, but I, I, I remember asking Steve Hackett the first time, I've interviewed him like eight times, of Genesis. He's, he left in, in 77, I think, 76. Mm -hmm. I asked him, I said, well, like, why are we doing an interview? Your time, it's like eight o'clock in the morning. And he said, well, I don't do that stuff anymore. I don't, I can't do it. And he says, my body can't keep up to it. But, and I said, well, what made you change your lifestyle? I'm always curious. I come from a long line of alcoholics and I always have to watch myself. Oh. Why? Why are you, well, how can you be the guy that, and there's a lot of them that are still doing it. You can still get up there. You still do a good job. I've seen the footage. You still got it. You know, like, you know what? You've still got grit. You still want to do it, obviously, because it shows. Uh, at, how did you save your own life from, how did you, how did you save your own life? Well, I, I realized very early on that I can't do, I, I've either got to be committed to doing this and being the lead singer and, and being the front man and, and being strong and being, and keeping my voice, protecting my voice. Uh, and I can't, uh, well, I'll tell you what happened. I mean, in the early seventies, uh, Everybody wanted to do cocaine. Everybody was doing cocaine, everybody. And people were surrounding us, dealers, and they were, everybody was giving us drugs. And uh, I, I kind of was a pot smoker, you know? And I, even, and I couldn't even smoke pot when we had gigs because I thought it would, you know, it would be, it would kill my high notes. So I didn't smoke pot very much, but, uh, especially if we do a lot of shows in a row, uh, I'd get tired and I'd think cocaine would be helping me. And the, the kiss of death was, I'll tell you the story. One night it, we were in San Francisco playing Winterland and that, which was a big, big deal. And we were headlining Winterland and we used to do this, uh, uh, we used to do this kind of, it was a, it was a rip off of a, of a uh, uh, of a bit we saw in a movie where there's a table full of fruit and and it was like a, a buffet table with fruit and everything and in the middle of the table was a big chrome dome like a a, a, a dome lid on a on a tray and uh, it was actually a Danny K bit that I I ripped off. And so you, we cut a hole in the table and we cut a hole in the, you know, and we put the, and I would get inside the, this was an opening number of the show. And I'd get inside the, the table and stick my head up, but I'd be covered with this dome, right? And then we'd do this song. Uh, it was called Luncheon, Lunch Face, I think. It was on, it was on one of those archive records. And, and the band would do an overture Right. And then they would come. And when we got to the opening of the song, they would come over and take the dome off and there would be my head and I'd be surrounded by food and vegetables and everything. And I'd be, and the mic was stick right, was right here. And I'd sing the song luncheon. Look what we're having for luncheon. I prepared it with devotion. So come and scarf it down. And then I would be trying to eat the food as I'm doing it. Right. And and I was really tired. And uh, oh God. So there's the Coke dealers backstage, right? And and I'm really tired. And and everybody's doing a little bit of cocaine. And he goes, Oh, here have some. He goes, You're tired. Here have some. I've got this Merck pharmaceutical cocaine. And I was not really a Coke snorter. And I really I wasn't 
jonesing for it, but I thought, oh, I'm really so tired. Okay. And so he gives me this giant blast of cocaine. And, and then in the blackout, before we go on, I sneak out and I crawl under the table and I stick my head in the, underneath the dome thing. You know, and I'm going, and I'm, and then it's starting to come on, and I went, oh my God, this is, this is not good. And I know, I knew this is a huge mistake. And so then we, the song starts, and I sing the song, and the Coke starts to drip down the back of my throat. And what happens is it, 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 it numbs your vocal cords because it's a anesthetic. And, so I'm, I, can't, I can't feel what I'm doing. And I'm singing and I'm excited and I'm, I'm jacked up and I'm singing the song. And like halfway through the set, I lose my voice. And it's just, I've blown it out because I can't feel it. And I can't, I can't, I, I don't, I'm trying to hit high notes and I'm pushing too hard and I blow out my voice. And we get to the big finale, White Punks on Dope, and I can't sing at all. I'm like, why punks on dope? Why? And I'm completely screwed. And I just, you know, I and I just I, I made it, I made a decision and that it was a nightmare for me. And everyone, well, what happened? How come you what's wrong with your voice? Or, uh, and I just kind of went, you know. I will never do this again as long as I live, ever. I will never do this. And that was 73, 74. And I quit. That's And I never did it again. Uh, wow. Actually, I did it one more time in Canada, which is a pretty good story, too, if you have time. Yeah, yeah, of um, course. <laughs> uh, so I, I wasn't, I didn't do drugs. I just didn't do it. And I wouldn't smoke pot and I wouldn't do that. And I would, I just said, you know, I'm, I'm the front man here. I, my voice is my most important thing. I've got to stay thin and I've got to stay strong and I've just got to stay. And I have, I've been, I've worked out my whole entire life. You know, I still go to the gym three times a week and I work out and I ride my horses and I, I take the dog for a walk up the big hill over in Franklin Canyon. And, uh, you know, I stay in, I stay. So anyway. But is that nurture, just before you get to that story, is that nurture nature? What, uh, I'm just curious on what would make you, because a lot of people say what you said and they still do it. We, we've seen oh. them. They're, some, of those, some of those people are dead. We don't have yeah. to mention names. We know who they are. Yeah. Uh, there was an ex-drummer's uh, wife who told me that, Oh my, he died a few years ago, fairly big drummer. She said, you know, personally, she, I've never put this on because I don't do that kind of stuff. She says he died of lifestyle cancer. That's what he died of. And, and we've all heard that, but what is it with you that, that uh, it sounds like a good idea not to do those things, but what do you, is it, is I it guess, taught? I mean, I'm just curious. Just, I don't know. I, I guess it's just what Daisy, it's okay. It's will it's will. And I have a strong will and, and uh, I just said, I can't, I'm, I'm, I want to, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be 72 in September. Okay. And I'm still doing this and I'm still thin. I'm still like, I weigh 190 pounds. I'm six foot four and I'm rock hard when it comes to the gym. And I just, you know, I want to do this for as long. I mean, the stage is my life. And that what that's what makes the world go round for me. And I've got to hold on to it for as long as I can. And I just, I will not do it. And I, like, I just, I just, I just made a resolution. You can't do that. Don't ever do that again. And and I don't, even, you know, I don't even smoke pot anymore because it's just so strong. It just knocks the shit out of me and I can't do it. But the one time that I broke away from this and it was not intentional, uh, I did a movie called Ladies and Gentlemen, The Fabulous Stains, which was a movie directed by Lou Adler and Laura Dern. It was her first movie. And Diane Lane was the star. And uh, uh, isn't Diane her mother, or am I getting two people? Diane Lane, who's 
Lower Dirt. Her mother was also a, started with a D. Oh, her mother okay. was an actress also. Yeah, I'll look it up. Uh, I'll put it up here. It'll Ray be- Winston was in it. And all the Sex Pistols were in it. Steve Jones and and Paul Cook and Paul Simonon from The Clash. It was a movie about an old, an old uh, heavy metal band on the road with a young punk band. And, the hem- and I was the leader of the heavy metal band, Lou Corpse. My name was Lou Corpse. And it was the, you know, the changing of the guard. And, the, and then the girls were like an even younger band who, anyway, you should watch it. It's a really great movie. It was never released because the guys in the Sex Pistols changed the, said on every other word. And the woman who wrote the script, they wouldn't say her lines. She ended up leaving in the middle of the production because the, the Sex Pistols, all they did was say and, and add to every line they had pretty much. And so uh, there's one scene where, and Vince Welnick was in the movie. Vince played the guitar player and I played the lead singer of this band, the Metal Corpses. And in the movie, uh, there's a scene where we score Coke in a club, right? And, and uh, in Canada, I'm sure you know, they have 30% of the cast has to be Canadian. When you're, And we were working in Vancouver, right? And... Uh, I loved it. It was so great. And Lou Adler was the director. And there was Grouse Mountain was there. I don't know if you've ever been to Vancouver. I, I lived in Vancouver from uh, 1989 to 1992. Oh, so I used oh, to no, go- no, no. Sorry, I have got to get straight because people will call me on it uh, who watch my channel. 1989 to 2002. Sorry about that. Didn't mean OK. That. Well, this was 1980 when we did it. And so it's supposed to be a scene where we're scoring coke. And uh, the, the, the guy that was playing the Coke dealer was a Canadian guy, okay? And so we're rehearsing and we're saying the lines and they're giving, and they're give us, the, the Coke is uh, this inositol, you know, this white baby powder. It looks like, or baby laxative, you know, that looks like Coke. And so we're doing the scene and the Coke dealer has got the, and also tall, and we, you know, we, we told, and, and I mean, I, I remember the line. I said, "Well, how much is it?" And he goes, "It's two fifty a gram," and I kind of went, "Can I get an eighth? <laughs> and that's how cheap he was. And so, and he goes, "No." And so, they, we do all the rehearsal. So they go, "Okay, well, let's roll the cameras," and, uh, and so the the guy who played the coke dealer. He goes, he turns out he's a Coke dealer. He goes, I'm not snorting any more of this inositol. This sucks. And he whips out a bindle of real cocaine. Okay. And he doesn't tell the director. He doesn't tell anybody. He goes, well, I'm not snorting this. And I'm going, dude. And he goes, this is, the, you know, and I don't, uh, okay. And I haven't, you know. And so, and so. We do this, and we ha- and so we're snorting coke. And we're going, ah, 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 I'm trying to remember my lines, and uh, we have to do like ten takes. You know, we have this point of view and that point of view, and the master, and then this. And I'm just, oh, oh. and by the time we're done, you know, I'm just going, oh my god, I don't know, I, I, I was just completely screwed, and that was the only other time. I did coke, and I once again I went, oh jeez, no, I'm never again, never again. So that was 1980. So that was 42 years ago. That was the last time. Well, good for you. Listen, I'm doing a history of Canadian music, and I know that you were on uh, Fish and Musician. Oh yeah, um, on SCTV, and that used to be filmed in Edmonton, where I lived when I first moved away from home. This right, province, I right, moved to Edmonton. Right. Where did you guys film that? Where was that when you the tubes were on there? Uh, and we did also Catherine O'Hara's bit too. We did talk to you later on uh, Lola Heatherton show. Oh, yeah. uh, well, John Candy, uh, God, he was so cool. We we flew to Edmonton and they said, okay, we're gonna we're gonna do Sushi Girl and we're gonna do it at this lake outside of Edmonton, about an hour away, some lake, and I don't remember the name. Was it Alberta Lake or Edmonton Lake or Alberta Lake or? 
Maybe Edmonton. Like, I don't know. There's a little cabin there and kind of like little huts that you could live in or sleep overnight in. So we, he said, uh, they said, be ready to go at six, six o'clock in the morning. And John, will, we're going to get a limousine and he's going to come and pick you guys up. And we're going to drive out to the lake and do the show. And we're going, and I'm, and I said, well, do we have lines? Is there a script or something? Like, no, don't worry about it. He'll do it. He'll take care of it. Okay. So six o'clock in the morning, John Candy shows up and he's sitting in the back of the limousine. He says, come on, get in guys. And he's got a case of beer and a bag of weed like this bag, big. And he's smoking a joint and drinking a beer. He goes, come on. And so we all smoked pot and drank beer for an hour all the way out to the lake. And then, and then, and so we're, and, he, and there's a bunch of rowboats and they've got a guy with a camera and the rowboat. And we're like, and there, I said, well, what do we, he goes, just ad lib. And so he ad libs the whole thing. We're like pulling up boots and all this in the, in the lake. And then we go into the cabin and it's all, there's no script. It's all ad lib. And he's like brilliant. And they've got, you know, a, a stack of trout that's, you know, gutted trout on a big table. And, and, then, they, and then they've got a giant bucket of rice, white rice, and they pour the white rice on top of the, and they went, okay, go sing She's a Beauty. And so, I mean, Sushi Girl. And so I, okay, and then I'm pouring the rice into the guts of the fish and eating, oh. and it was all him. It was all him. He, he, he had it all in his head. It was, the guy was brilliant. He was so brilliant. I loved, SCTV was so great. I mean, I mean, it was, I saw Catherine O'Hara not too long ago uh, at a gig and, uh, and, I'm sure you've seen Shit's Creek, and uh, it's so good. It's really great. It's crazy good. I didn't expect that. I kept going. You know, you always assume, and it's maybe it's a human nature thing to watch something where, we, oh, they're past their prime. And I was the biggest SCTV fan, and I watched it. I'm going, oh my god, this is like top shelf. I know, I know. Eugene Levy, he's brilliant, and that guy is his son. I didn't realize yeah. that. Remember, if you want to see the entire interview, it's on our sister channel, Rock History Book. There'll be links to the podcast and the entire interview, as well as all things tubes. Remember, support our channel by liking our video. Also, share them on groups you may be a member of. If they fit in those groups, please share them on that or your timeline. It helps our channel. Subscribe to our channel. And of course, always comment on them. We'd appreciate that. I'm John Bowden. This is Rock History Music. More from Fee Waybill in the next two, three days.